We're going to ask the chairman of our board, Mike Sullivan, the former mayor of the city of Lawrence, to give some quick greetings, and then Mike will introduce our sponsors, and then we'll start our program. Welcome to the chairman of the board. Uh, good afternoon all. I'm here to give greetings on behalf of the uh, Merrimack Valley Chamber of Commerce. Shout out to anybody who is on the board of directors, presently or in the past, please raise your hand. All right, how about a round of applause? Uh, chair person over here, and I wanted just to shout out to one of the chamber ambassadors, Mr. Tommy Spitaleri, right here from Lawrence Community Access TV. Thank you so much. The expo is fantastic. The first couple of hours, we're going to be here at three o'clock next door. Make sure you visit that. And special thanks to Madam Secretary. Thank you for being here on behalf of the state. We're looking forward to a lively discussion. And I'm going to turn it over to our Vice President, Mike Babalak. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank the uh, Secretary for joining us this afternoon, as well as our speaking panel also. And Joe said we're going to get a photo after this uh, presentation. Um, I just want to thank you all for being here today. As Mike said, the Merrimack Valley Chamber Business Expo is taking place today. It will be uh, taking place from 10 a.m. We started this morning until 3 p.m. So right after you leave this room, head right downstairs in Michael's Function Hall. Check out all the products and services on display. Visit your fellow members and show them some support. So again, we'll be right downstairs until 3 p.m. today. Just want to thank our sponsors of our lunch today. And without them, we couldn't do what we do. So um, I want to thank our Expo Luncheon sponsors, All Pro Electric, the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission, and Minko Development Corporation. So I just want to say thank you to them. Our staff environmental also. So thank you all for sponsoring. I want to recognize some individuals that are here, and again, I apologize. I've just said there's so many people here that we now have exceeded our capacity, so I'm, I'm going to have to skip over some, but I want to recognize the economic development directors I know from Methuen, not the Andover and Lawrence are here. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Representative Paul Reyes is here. Congratulations. Thank you for coming. Senator Pablo Payanos is here. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. And Madam Secretary, I want to tell you two people that we could not work without on a regular basis. I want to recognize Maria De Stefano and Peter Milano. They are absolutely fantastic to work with. And I want to say thank you to my good friend Juan, who's sitting here as well. He's somewhere in the audience. Juan, E O A G. Welcome, Juan. And I know I miss people. I apologize. It's just that we're trying to move. We're going to try to move quickly as we can. Um, we're going to uh, be served dinner or lunch any minute now, but I want to tell you about the Chamber real quickly. As you know, the Merrimack Valley Chamber is the largest, most effective business organization serving businesses throughout the entire Merrimack Valley. Uh, we began our year with the uh, Merrimack Valley Mayors and Town Managers with the Lieutenant Governor. Then we proceeded to two members of Congress, then the State Senators. We're working on a date for the State Representatives and the Speaker of the House. And the Secretary of Labor is coming, we think, in May. This morning we had our business uh, expo breakfast program on energy and the environment the chamber has, an award-winning clean energy program. We won uh, an award for all of New England because of our clean energy program and the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Now what? The Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs was our guest speaker, and now we are so honored that the new Secretary of Economic Development, Direct Economic Development is here. As a former economic development director, I welcome her comments because I know the initiatives are going to be absolutely fantastic. We're looking forward to working together to help the initiatives to go forward. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to um, have the, uh, the the restaurant serve lunch, and if we could call upon the secretary. And again, let me say this. I said this this morning. I'll say this again. It is so easy for the secretary and her office to say to us, look, we're in Boston. We can't come out to Haverhill. But let me tell you that uh, it's so important uh, for us to be able to meet with the secretary directly, for her to actually see you, because you're all the people that are actually doing the work here in the Merrimack Valley. This is where the growth, in my opinion, is occurring. We have real developers. We have real economic development offices. We have real small businessmen and women. Uh, and let me tell you, this is where things are happening in the Merrimack Valley. Just go down and see the expo. 
It was packed earlier. People want to get out and showcase their products, showcase their services. They want to do business in the Merrimack Valley. And when I'm on your conference calls, Madam Secretary, I always say Joe Bevelacqua on the border of New Hampshire because we always face that competition on a regular basis. Our new secretary is ready to handle that competition and lead the competitors of Massachusetts Ford. Please welcome our new Massachusetts Secretary of Economic Development. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, I love that. Um, so I guess he's a little bit biased, but he did tell me this: the Merrimack Valley is the best chamber of commerce. Is that right? That is true. So that's the chairman. Call me chairman. Yes. Chairman. Well, I'm hugely grateful for this chance to meet with you all today. And many of you I've seen on Zooms, but it's definitely not the same as seeing people in real life. So huge thanks uh, to Joe and to the whole team for uh, putting this all together for hosting us. And um, it is. Uh, it is really awesome to be here in the Merrimack Valley. It's not very far from Boston, actually, so I'm happy to come up anytime. And I'm call you a lot. Yes, no, I'm happy to come up anytime. And I, I would echo um, uh, the comments here, which is that I do think this is a really exciting uh, region of the state. There are so many great things going on here. I just spent the morning with Sal Poli and seeing the Riverwalk and then hearing about all the other projects at Haverhill and Littleton and uh, in Lowell. There is so much opportunity here, and, and it sounds like there's more developers who want to do work. I love the small businesses that are next door and ate some vegan donuts. And uh, and also, it's great to see all the, the, the kind of collaboration with the regional banks and all the different parts of the community. So huge thanks to all of you for the important work you do here in the Merrimack Valley. It's, it's, uh, it's hugely important. So don't you? Great. Um, I also do want to acknowledge that, um, so I've now been in the role for not quite three months, actually. And uh, it has been uh, a whirlwind. I feel very honored to have this privilege to serve our state. I am learning a ton. And I feel really lucky that many of our team members are staying on. And they are super experienced and know a lot. So as Joe mentioned, we have Peter Milano and Maria from MOBD. Where are they? There's someone here. Um, thank you, Peter and Maria. And then we have um, Under Secretary Stolba and also Juan from her team. And they do so much of the investment here. So, Please grab them all um, as well. So I'm a couple months in. It's been a busy couple months. Um, we've, we've already launched a lot of different initiatives, as probably you've seen. So just this week, we announced that Mashworth Capital is kicking off their $78 million in grants for small businesses, focused on women-led businesses, people of color, veterans, and all kinds of different um, small businesses across the state. So that's really exciting. And $78 million is a lot of money. So we're really excited to put that to work. Um, we also are going to congratulate all of you here in Merrimack Valley. Uh, I think next week, um, Keiko uh, from the tourism uh, uh, group on yes. my team, they're going to be here to award you a million dollar grant for the Merrimack Valley for tourism. So huge congrats to all of you for the great work there as well. Um, so we've launched a budget uh, and we also now are kicking off our state's economic development planning process. So we do this process once every four years. It's mandated by state legislature. And the goal is that we really want to figure out where do we go from here as a state. So by the end of the calendar year, we're going to deliver a written plan with set of priorities, and hopefully on the back of that, an economic development bill to make the investments and to really put the resources behind fueling our state's economy for the next many years. Um, we will have a council. We're going to have a bunch of regional um, meetings, which I hope one of them will be here in the Merrimack Valley, or multiple ones. You're hosting us. Great. And I'd love to see all of you there and, and uh, have your ideas and input and feedback on what we can be doing better together to um, support this region and our state. We'll also do some sector-specific uh, meetings, and we really want to make sure we, um, we get all your input. As we kick off this economic development planning process, there's a couple of things that I'm thinking hard about for, uh, for us. Um, one of them is as we think about economic development, you know, we're in a pretty good spot in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we've been a pretty strong state. We have a lot of leading uh, industries around education, around uh, life sciences, hospital systems, um, our financial services. But we have more work to do. I think, especially here on the border of New Hampshire, you all have seen this. Post pandemic, we've been one of the top states for out migration. And we have people leaving our state in higher numbers. It's gotten easier to do you know, post-COVID with remote work. And one of the states that people are going to the most is New Hampshire. And almost every week, I get an email or phone call from business saying, hey, I'm thinking about moving my company to New Hampshire. 
and we don't want that. We want to keep everyone here in Massachusetts, and especially in the Merrimack Valley. Yes. So we have work to do here on this economic development plan, and there are a couple of things that we're thinking about. One is that as we think about economic development, we have to make sure every region in the Commonwealth uh, wins. So, you know, we need Boston and Cambridge to win, but it's not enough if just Boston and Cambridge do well. We need every region, Western Mass, Central Mass, Merrimack Valley, South Shore, the Cape, Northern So we're very committed to that. And you'll see in some of our, um, some of the ways that we're uh, deploying our team that we're committed to that. So um, Under Secretary Stolba has added two new positions under her uh, team. One of them was announced a couple weeks ago, which is a dedicated person just for rural and agricultural businesses and communities. It's a really important backbone and economic foundation of our whole um, you know, state. We're also having a dedicated role just to small micro businesses as well. To again, focus on the unique challenges and opportunities. And again, small businesses are, I think, are 98% of the businesses in the state and make up 50% of employment. So this is another very important part of the backbone of our state. So those are going to be things that we think a lot about. The other thing we're going to think a lot about is how we focus on economic growth for all kinds of humans. We want every family and every person in the Commonwealth to thrive. And again, so we love our you know PhDs and the, um, and amazing scientists. We love them and we want them to stay here. But we also need you know folks who have high school degrees or vocational degrees or community college degrees to all do well across the state. So that's something else that's going to be really important to us. So um, I'm looking forward to, to spending more time with all of you. But uh, you know this is you all are doing really important, amazing work, and so we want to make sure that we are Team Massachusetts and also Team Merrimack and that we will do all we can to support you. So very much looking forward to spending more time. You know, let me tell you, the opportunities are endless and we're here to help and, and I just want to follow up on a few items. Uh, you mentioned um, a number of initiatives. First of all, the Chamber is a very active women in business program, the fastest growing segment of our, of our membership. Uh, we're very involved with veterans. We have a veterans assistance program and because of the leadership of Mike Sullivan and the Chamber of Commerce, this Merrimack Valley Chamber of Commerce took the um, a Gold Star family's home that was completely to rehab and we totally rehabbed the house at no cost to the family for the Gold Star Sergeant from Lawrence. Um, in terms of, um, uh, you mentioned tourism, where'd Nancy go? Nancy Gardella from the North of Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau was standing up somewhere. Uh, the Chamber is one of the partners of that million dollar program because of tourism. And uh, you mentioned the uh, mass growth capital, I just saw Larry Andrews sneaking in I think in the back. Right? We um, communicated that uh, email out yesterday that went out to all our members because we want to promote opportunities for grants for veterans, minorities, and others, um, underserved uh, locations and people. And the Chamber also provides free business counseling with SCORE with um, other organizations every uh, week uh, in English or Spanish. So we're involved in every one of the initiatives you have, Madam Secretary. We're going to be your success story. Yay. And as part of that, we have a small developer that's going to speak, and then another small developer will speak next. And uh, please welcome, um, he's the former chairman of our board of directors. He started out with one pizza store. You've all heard the story. He now has about four million square feet, maybe more. Uh, please welcome Sal Lapoli from the Lapoli Company. First of all, I just want to thank everyone for being here today. This is a big day. Awesome. Whenever we have an opportunity to the Secretary of Economic Development for the state of Massachusetts up to hear our businesses specific, I think it's always an exciting day. I look across the crowd and I see many faces that have started small businesses, maybe one and two person uh, organizations that have now grown into a dozen people or maybe even more, 50, 60, 100 people. So proud of you, so proud to be a member of the Chamber for so many years and continue to be a part of that. You know, the Merrimack Valley is really special. It's special because of this chamber. All of the people that belong here are part of the success of this chamber. And I think the secret sauce in this organization is not the fact that we're successful in our own businesses, and success is not determined by the number of zeros after the one. Success is determined by the amount that you help your community, by the amount that your employees benefit from, by the amount that you're able to spread your goodwill across the city and across the state. That's the success. <laughs> Uh, the rest of the zeros after the one, they come as a result of that. That is a byproduct of, of sharing this goodwill. But we're successful because we stand together. And I think the more organizations like the Merrimack Valley, like the businesses in the Valley that stand together, will be stronger. You know, my dad used to tell me a story all the time, and, and I always take an opportunity to, to thank my mother and father, my brother James, 
you know, they were all instrumental in my life. They helped guide me and my family of who we are today and who you are is where you came from. So I think what's really important is, is, is to remember the people that, remember the people that help get you where you are today. It's those employees, it's those family members. But my dad used to say, you know, if I hold up a, one finger and I poke you, I'm not gonna cause too much damage. If I poke you with two fingers, I'm not gonna cause damage. But if I take those five fingers and I close it, I'm gonna cause a lot of damage. And that's what the people in this room can do together. If we all stay together, we all work with each other, and then there's an opportunity to share our businesses with each other, then we will all prosper. So I just, on behalf of the chamber, being former uh, chairman of the board, uh, now uh, the, the great Michael Sullivan, former mayor of Lawrence, but a dear, a dear friend of mine for over 20 years, is now your now your leader and, and doing an unbelievable job. And thank you very much, Michael. But on behalf of the chamber, I just want to say thank you very much. Secretary, I want to thank you for coming up here, and I want to thank everyone, and I wish them prosperous. And if there's anything our organizations can do for anyone in this room, please contact our organization. We'd be happy to help you in any way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sal. I want to introduce another former chairman of the board, and it's amazing. it just shows you that the chamber understands business, both small business, large companies, as well as um, those in the tourism and hospitality industry. Um, so many introductions. But you see these signs, these Minko signs all over the place? They're from Lou Minicucci, the president and owner of Minko Company. Lou, that's you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Joe, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, when Joe asked me to speak today, it, it, Joe's a hot guy to say no to. So I've agreed, obviously I agreed to come and speak, um, but you, you get what you pay for, so to speak, and Joe isn't paying me for this, so the information that I'm gonna give you today is I'm not sure how, how accurate it's gonna be. But a little, I was going to take a little different bend on what's been presented so far and try to give you a little uh, history of, of uh, what I think is the problem with the housing crisis. So I'm frequently asked every single day, why is housing so expensive? Why are, as if it's the developer's fault? And uh, why is there such a shortage of housing? And I don't really have the answer to that because it's a very complex question. But the big issue really is a supply and demand issue. So as we all know, as, as demand for our housing continues to grow, and our supply does not keep up with it, it's going to consequently cause an increase in rental rates and housing rates. So we have a total imbalance of supply and demand. And why is that so? So I started in the housing field uh, 50 years ago. I was an executive director of the North End of a Housing Authority for 10 years. Then I started my business at Minco 42 years ago and have been in the housing uh, development uh, process, both uh, from a public standpoint and a private, for the last 50 years. So I've seen a lot of changes that have happened and have occurred. So if we're gonna go back to supply and demand, the, um, the demand has increased significantly because of population growth. 50 years ago in Massachusetts, we had 5.7 million people. In the 2020 census, uh, we had about 7 million. Now we've lost, uh, we've lost uh, about 50,000 people in population over the last couple of years, and I think the secretary alluded to the fact that once COVID hit and remote the workforce is possible and people are moving to New Hampshire and other parts of the country. But for the most part, our population growth over the last 50 years has increased significantly by about 25%. The other issue is housing formation. So what people don't really understand is that you have population growth and people can relate to that, but the housing formations have, have been significant over the last 50 years. And just on my own analysis, I figured it's been about 28% of, of new housing formation. And this is a result of family, uh, people are not getting married at a young age. They give, they're waiting. Of divorce rates 50 years ago were nowhere near what they are today, 50%. And people having one or two, uh, two or three homes. So there's a person somewhere here in the Merrimack Valley that has a home and then has a summer home in... in Salisbury or Newburyport or someplace of that nature, 
So housing formations have been significant. And um, that is a result of all of the things I just mentioned, but also housing sizes. So the typical household size 50 years ago was 3.2 persons per household. Now it's 2.5. So that's a 28% increase in housing formation. If all things were being, if all things were equal and there was no population increase, we would still be in a deficit for housing. And, and so the, the opposite side, so that's the pretty much um, the demand side. So now what's happening on the supply side? If supply kept up with demand, there'd be no issue. And if supply could outpace demand, pricing would go down. But that's not happening. And why is that? And why is supply so constrained? And I, want, I go back to my initial years 50 years ago, and, uh, and I was asked this question by the Eagle Tribune, I still have the article, and they said, why do we have a housing shortage? And this was 50 years ago, nothing like it is today. And I said, because we're, we have done everything possible, most smaller communities have done everything possible to restrict housing supply. And doing it, I think, read with, with good intentions. And so our town, and I'm going to take North Andrew because that's where I grew up and that's where I'm from, but the very first neighborhoods were 5,000 square foot lots. And then it was 10,000 square foot lots. Then it became a half acre, one acre, two acre lots. So that the supply side was constrained because communities made it ever more difficult to develop housing by the sheer size of the lots and the expenses that develop the land area. So you take a town like North Andrew, it's about 25 square miles, we have 30,000 people. You take Manhattan, about the same size, 25,000 square miles, they have 100, uh, 1 1.6 million people. You talk to people in North Andrew where we've got too much density, there's too much development. And we really don't have too much development. That land mass area could support significantly more housing than exists. But what we don't have is the tools to allow that to happen. We don't have the proper zoning. So what we do have is what appears to be an overdevelopment because we have urban sprawl. We have road systems that go out forever to go get to the two acre lots. And we have all this infrastructure and not a lot of density. And we don't have open space because we, we have housing where it should be open space. So we have the demand side and the supply side. I think it's basic economics of why housing is uh, so expensive and continues to be more expensive. We, we, uh, we currently have uh, a need, and it depends what you read, of uh, uh, over 110,000 units that we need addressed today in terms of demand. The projection by 2040 is 400,000 additional units. Now we're building on average statewide about 17,000 units per year. So we're not keeping pace, we're not even addressing the, the uh, critical shortage of housing that exists today. So I don't see this getting much better and as I see the horizon coming um, with a lot of different issues. Construction costs have gone up That's probably 50% over the last, been going up 15, 20% a year, so last four or five years has gone up very significantly. Interest rates used to be 3.5% for multi-family development, now they're 6 and 7%. So I see continued pressure being put on the supply side. I see every less and less supply coming online, creating a bigger demand and higher pricing. Now that all could potentially change if the economy softens, and the economy could soften if there isn't sufficient housing to support the industry and workforce that we really need, not only in the Merrimack Valley, but in, in, in greater Boston. So um, thank you for listening to that. It's a little different approach than what Joe does, but I, I, I don't want this held against me. When I, when I was originally um, on the chamber and became the chairman the year after, I was on the selection committee that selected Joe as our fearless leader. 
So last I, 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 and I think that was an excellent decision. Would you agree? Yes. All right. Thank you. One of the things that I really want to say about our board of directors is that really in tune with the community and whether it be Sal or whether it be Lou or whether it be now Michael, they all understand both the needs of business and how we can help business. And each of them have one mandate, serve the business community, serve the community at large. That's why the Merrimack Valley Chamber of Commerce, in addition to you know, rehabbing the Gold Star Family House, we've done, we did eight or nine food drives last year, diaper drives. Uh, we did two, three already this year. You know, we're going to do more in the community, and you're going to hear about some more activities. Uh, let me just say something about small business that the secretary talked about, both Sal and Lou talked about as well, and about minority business. The chamber is actively involved in assisting our minority business friends. This year, it is now public, the Merrimack Valley Chamber of Commerce nominated a minority business member of our chamber to be the Massachusetts Small Business Administration's Business of the Year, and he won! Ed Crespo is our new, he'll be awarded that in May. Uh, Mike will be there in conjunction, but again, it's an example of the work of the Chamber working together with our members to get things done, to make connections, and to make business happen here in the Merrimack Valley. So wherever you look, the Merrimack Valley Chamber is actively involved. I want to recognize a new company when I say new, a company that not many of you know enough about, and we need to do more about that, and that's why she's here today. So Fawn Smith is the Executive Director of E4L, Epara Totus. Did I do well? I'm close. Epara. Please welcome. I'm A. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It's pronounced like an A in Spanish. Epara. Epara Totus. Please welcome our guest speaker, Savan. I'm trying. I'm trying. A for effort, Joe, that's for sure. <laughs> but listen, I'm not the expert here because that's my rudimentary Spanish that I've learned in high school, so it's, it's coming full swing now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my goodness, you have food in your bellies. I expected a little more enthusiasm. I'm going to try that again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So much better. Thank you. This is wonderful to see everyone in person versus like a virtual call. So thank you for being here in person. Again, my name is Sofan Smith. The easiest way to remember my name, if you're like, what was her name again? Think of it as so fun, so far, so good. <laughs> most of the time, I am good, most of the time, 95% of the time. And as Joe said, I represent an organization called E for All, Entrepreneurship for All. My site name is E for Evaratoros, Merrimack Valley, and that's because we're a hybrid site, and I'll explain what that means a little later on. Show of hands, who here has heard about E for All? Oh. All right, so some know, so I see some familiar faces, and some do not know. Amazing. For the folks that do not know, I'm going to wow you with my speech. For the folks that do know that I have heard this spiel before. So e for all is an entrepreneurship organization that started in Lowell, Massachusetts in 2010. At that time, it was known as the Merrimack Valley Sandbox. And it was created in partnership with UMass Lowell, and it was originally funded through the Dish Pondé Foundation. In 2012, we launched our very first business accelerator program. And I'll go more into details about that. And then in 2014, we officially incorporated, well, we became a 501c3 and changed our name to Entrepreneurship for All. In that same year, 2014, we launched our very first Spanish-speaking site called Embaradoros in Lawrence. And so now you're wondering, so what exactly does e for all do? Well, we are in the business of turning dreams into businesses. What that means is that we work with entrepreneurs and we help them, we work with them to teach them how to launch their own small business. So show of hands, who here are small business owners? Okay, awesome. Who here started off as an entrepreneur solo? <coughs> exactly. So those are the folks that I'm talking about. What's the difference between an entrepreneur and a small business? Well, our entrepreneurs, they're a micro business. They're typically a one-person operation. They are the, the uh, CEO, the COO, the CMO, you name it. They do it all. 
Since we've launched our Business Accelerator program, we have helped over 1,100 businesses here in the Merrimack Valley. And those businesses in 2021 alone generated $54 million in revenue. They also helped create local jobs, 1,700 local jobs to be exact. And so if you're wondering, well, who exactly are these folks that EFRAL is helping? 76% of our entrepreneurs are women-owned, so ladies, you run the world. <laughs> but you already knew that, right, Joe? No, just check, just check. Exactly, see, now you're a married man, you know. This is how, this is how you stay married. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, if you don't know, catch up. Trust me, I'll help you with your next anniversary. So, 70% of our entrepreneurs are BIPOC-owned. That's Black Indigenous People of Color. 36% are folks who were previously unemployed, and 30% are folks who are immigrants. So that shows you a little bit of the communities we serve, the entrepreneurs we serve, and the impact that we have in the communities. But here's my favorite number. Because of the program and support and the seed money that we provide, 70% of our entrepreneurs are still active or still running their business after three years of launching. That's actually above the U.S. average. Thank you. Yes. We started in Lowell, Massachusetts, like I said earlier. We've now branched out and we've grown a lot in the last 10 plus years. So now we have eight EFRAL communities here across the Commonwealth. We have an EFRAL in New York, Colorado, Arkansas, Rhode Island, and then soon Maine. That's coming up this summer. Yeah. But Mass is the best. But Massachusetts, particularly the Merrimack Valley, is the best. Absolutely. That's my, that's my site's name. I love the Merrimack Valley. I am a Lowellian. I was born in Cambodia, but raised in the city of Lowell my entire life. I went to the public school system, including UMass Lowell, and actually started when I was in college. I worked with the Lowell Small Business Assistance Center. And so I like to say my professional circle has definitely, uh, or my professional career has come full circle, excuse me. And, you know, what's powerful about entrepreneurs and small business is that we are seeing such a huge shift in our cons with our consumers. They're much more aware now of who they're buying from, right? And they're also more aware of supporting our local small businesses, which is great. And that's why we continue to do what we do. You see, when we work with a person to teach them the power of entrepreneurship, and they can own their own business, Think about it. They can then support themselves, support their family, create local jobs, right? There's power in that, and that's what we do. And we've been doing this for over 10 years through our programs and services. And if you're wondering what are those programs and services, very easy. We work with entrepreneurs through the three different stages that they go through on this journey. The first phase is the ideation phase. So let's say you have an idea. Um, let me ask someone in the room here. Anyone, does anyone have a hobby that they like to do on the side in addition to their full-time nine to five? Shout it out. Anyone? You sew. You sew? Is that what you said? You sew. What's your yeah. name? Christina. Christina. All right. Christina sews. That is a town that I'm looking to really hone in on. All right, so let's say Christina's been sewing and she's like, man, I love this sewing stuff. And I want to see if this is a business idea that can generate. So she's in that idea phase. So I would say, Christina, you should come to our community pitch contest and pitch your business idea to not only the community, but to a panel of judges. And perhaps you might win first prize, which is $1,000. So Christina comes, she has two and a half minutes to pitch, she pitches it, she wins a thousand dollars, and she's like, fantastic, this is going to go right back to her business. But then now she's in phase two, ready to launch. She comes back and she says, okay, I'm ready to take Christina sewing to the next level. How do I do that? I said, well, join our Business Accelerator program. That's a one-year program where we provide a business curriculum training a team of three mentors to help guide you while you're in this program to learn how to launch your business. That's phase two. Now Christina opens up her shop, Christina's Sewing World. It's going fantastic. But as a new business owner, right, for my entrepreneurs and small business owners here in the room, you understand this. There's a lot of challenges. Just because you have your business up and running does not mean you've learned everything, right? Business owners? Okay. So Christina says, 
I need ongoing support. And I say, great. Come um, and join our sister program called Entrepreneurs Forever, where we're going to provide that ongoing support. So those are the three or the three primary program services that we offer to help with our entrepreneurs along their journey. The ideation phase, ready to launch phase, and the ongoing business support. Again, my name is Sofan Smith, and I'm the executive director at Ifal and Parapodos, Merrimack Valley. And we are in the business of turning dreams into businesses. And I hope that if some of you are interested in learning more about the organization, please come and talk to me. Because one of the things that I'm most looking for are great mentors. And I will put this ask out right now. You heard me earlier, right, when I said 76% of our entrepreneurs are women-owned. I need more women mentors. So if you are a woman and you want to be an impact in the community, you want to be a mentor and guide some entrepreneurs along this journey, please come and talk to me. And gentlemen, I will not exclude you either. So you're more than welcome to come and talk to me as well. Thank you so much. And who after you got the grand opening of the new Haverhill office? What did we say was there? Joe was there. Joe was there. So I forgot to add. So Merrimack Valley, we cover low lowers and Haverhill. So Haverhill is very, very new. Uh, a lot of folks have been asking for our services and programs in Haverhill. So we finally expanded. We did a press release last year. So we have a co-working space now at Haverhill. So you can come visit us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and again, you can see the, 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 the diversity that the Chamber has in terms of helping any kind of business man or woman. Please take advantage of these connections that we bring to it. Uh, our next speaker is someone you probably not hear too much about in terms of uh, the organization, but let me tell you, um, I can tell you as a former planner and economic development director, this is an organization where you need data, when you need information, when you need ideas on trends, this is the organization you want to know in the Merrimack Valley. Please welcome Gerard Witten, the Executive Director of the Merrimack Valley Planning <laughs> Commission. Thank you, Joe, and good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you all. And a warm welcome again, Secretary of the Merrimack Valley. We're thrilled to have you here. Thank you for joining us. You know, folks, having the Secretary join us today is a clear indicator of the state's awareness and intentional focus on economic development here in the Valley. And today is a great example of the important role that the Chamber plays in getting us all together to talk about these important issues. My name is Gerard Witten. I'm the Executive Director of Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. And I'm honored to be here to talk to you today about something that I'm personally very passionate about, and that is the economy here in this great region that we call home. So over the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about our organization and help you to understand how MVPC fits into the broader ecosystem here in the Valley. And, uh, We'll also touch on some important data points, and then I'll conclude with a quote that I hope will be impactful to you as you think about the future of this region. So first, Merrimack Valley Planning Commission, we're one of the state's 13 regional planning agencies. We are your regional planning agency, and we work with the 15 cities and towns here in the region, everyone from Andover and Methuen on our western fringe to our coastal communities of Salisbury, Newburyport, Newbury, and Rowley. Now, from an organizational standpoint, it's our mission to promote the orderly and sustained growth of the region. And what that means is that, really, we created four programs that help us work towards that objective. We have an economic development program, we have a transportation program, environment, and information technology. And these programs make sense because as we're planning for the growth of the region, it's important to consider the impact on the environment or how we'll navigate between our destinations using our transportation and transit systems. Now, MVPC also serves as the Regional Economic Development Organization under the Secretary's Office of Business Development, and that's a unique and important role in that it allows us to work with businesses and communities to connect them to state and federal partners and funding programs. So we helped projects like the Revolving Test Kitchen in Lawrence or the Newburyport Bulkhead Repair Project to secure funding for implementation. So we play a modest, but I like to think important role in helping this region to grow and thrive. And when we're thinking about the future, I think you heard some really great comments today about what do we need to be considering to help this region continue to thrive. And in talking about this, I'd ask you to accept the basic premise that our economic growth and vitality is directly connected to the cost and availability of housing. Access to job and home leads to a vibrant economy 
And we have been hearing in the news that we simply aren't producing enough housing units to sustain and support our economic growth. And this has some real costs to this region, so I'll just touch on a few data points to help you understand how this issue impacts this region. So according to the census, uh, since 2016, the average cost of a single family home has increased by more than 40%. And with that dramatic increase, now in the Merrimack Valley, those of us under 50, about half of us are renting our housing. Those of us who purchased homes 15, 20 years ago are paying mortgages less than the average cost of rental. And the data also shows us that now in the Merrimack Valley, almost a third of us are classified as cost burden or severely cost burden, which means we're paying between 30 and 50% of our annual income on housing. Wow, I was right, that's impossible. <laughs> so I'm hoping you'll agree, this is an important issue we need to address. One thing I wanna mention is um, our communities are trying to produce more housing units. And this uh, push has been emphasized by the state through its implementation of the MBTA communities legislation. But let's face it, I think instinctively, many of us have a gut reaction which is somewhat resistant to change. We're concerned about the impact of the growth on the character of this region. Or will our infrastructure be able to support the growth? Or the bigger question of, you know, will there be enough resources to support us? But have we considered the alternative of not truly addressing this housing issue? Because the vitality and vibrance of this region are directly dependent on our ability to solve this housing supply and demand problem. In the book, The Power of Positive Deviance, How Unlikely Innovators Solve the World's Toughest Problem, the author, Jerry Stern, says it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. Again, it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. And for me, this quote really hits home when we're thinking about the housing issue that lies in front of us. And I'd like to use this as an opportunity to challenge all of us to reframe our thinking around this issue. Can we look at the need for housing as an opportunity to plan for and create the region that we imagine, thriving in its economy, preserving its cultural and natural resources, and offering transportation and transit services that are safe, efficient, and reliable. As the book mentions, we all have the power to be positive deviants, so I'd ask you to each think about your respective role in the Merrimack Valley economy and think about how you might be able to contribute to help solve this problem. You might even think about joining MBPC's Economic Development Committee. We'd love to have you. Or contribute your time to one of the local housing task forces. Or as many of you heard Mayor Gove suggest, contribute your time and expertise to one of our many municipal boards in our cities and towns. This is an important time in the Merrimack Valley, and it requires creative, thought-based actions. So I would challenge all of us to act our way into a new way of thinking. Thank you. everyone. Thank you. We're going to um, do two things. We're going to take questions from you or comments from you in the audience, and we're also going to give the secretary a chance to ask questions of the speakers if she'd like. Uh, anyone have a question or a comment? Uh, Madam? Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Oh, oh, how are you? So, my name is Eddie Graves. I represent uh, the Emerald City Opportunity Zone Fund. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to come in and actually build affordable housing. So what we want to do, is, what, what, I'm, what I'm hearing from you is that we'd like to engage the community. We want to be part of the community to do that. Well, I know you met the mayor earlier at the, yeah. at the prime. Oh, yeah, I'm out, I'm out No, no, I know that. Oh, and, uh, you met the secretary, obviously. You met, the, you met two or three uh, people from the state agencies. Right. Um, they are here to help. And, and one of the, this is an example, um, I think, why it's so important to do these types of programs, because it shows you that the state is here to help. And you have economic development directors from, and I'm sorry, Miss Gloucester. Sal De, welcome, Sal, from Gloucester. But Methua, not the end of Lawrence, are here. Uh, the Haverhill um, Community Development Director was here this morning. These communities are here to make things happen, and the state is here. Uh, do you want to make a comment? And, yeah. and just, yeah. just, to yeah. add, just to add to that, we're willing to work with the community yeah. and employ the community. Work with your debt as long as it falls into our, we're here. 
Well, I, I, I love that. So we are here to, to partner with all of you. And I love that there's been all of these comments today about housing. Uh, because, um, you know, we, we can create all the jobs we want and do all the economic development we want. But if we don't have affordable and plentiful housing, nothing's going to work. Right. And it's actually, you know, I think the comments earlier were really spot on, which is this is not the housing crisis we're in. I'm going to use that word crisis because that's how serious it is. Um, it's not something that would happen in the last year or two. This has been a decade plus in the making, and actually I don't think it is a supply and demand problem because there's plenty of people who want to <coughs> buy affordable housing or any kind of housing, and there's plenty of people who want to develop it. All of you developers want to build more of it. The issue is we have a collective action problem, which is that we just have a, the market has failed because everybody wants more affordable housing. You ask anybody in the state. I've been in the Berkshires, I've been in Worcester, I've been in Springfield, I've been you know, literally everywhere in Boston, and we want more affordable housing. We just don't want it next to us. That is the problem. We have a collective action problem. We would be so much better off as a state if every one of our towns built more housing, but no one wants to do it because they want the other town to do it. And so this is why, actually, the governor and lieutenant governor are very passionate about this topic, and they said on the campaign trail, they made a commitment that if they got elected, they would have a dedicated secretary just for housing because it is a very complex issue, and it requires someone waking up every day and focusing just on that. And so. This office that I'm in right now is housing and economic development, but I'm the most excited person. So we um, put forth on March 1st an Article 87 bill, and hopefully it'll get approved by the legislature. So coming soon, in the next couple of months, we will have a dedicated secretary uh, just focused on housing who can be much more strategic, much more proactive, and to work with all of the developers, the community members, and all of our different communities on how can we actually, as a state, collectively, fix this housing problem. So the numbers are staggering. I mean, it's a, I've heard 100,000 units short, I've heard 200,000 units short, and the master doesn't work. Right now, today, we're producing, you know, a couple thousand or 10,000 a year. You just do the math, that's not gonna work for us. And um, the other end of housing that's really challenging is that we are the only right to shelter state in the country, which is awesome, because we care about people. But what that means is that we are now in a shelter crisis. So every day we're, you know, we're fighting kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat, trying to find places to house families that are in desperate need of shelter. And the other problem is because we have a housing shortage, people are staying in shelter longer, which then means we need more shelter. And so these things are all related and they're very complex, but this is a huge priority for uh, Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, and a huge priority for me to partner with our new uh, secretary to, to you know, do all this important work. So we were gonna do it together, but we have work to do. Let, let me just say one thing. We are very fortunate in the Merrimack Valley. We have a tremendous state delegation that works together with the local communities. The local communities work together, and one of the things the Chamber does is it brings the local communities together along with the state delegation. So we're working together, together, not opposed to one another. So that's, I couldn't think, going to make it a little bit easier for, to be able to advance some of these initiatives because people do work together. And I think that's so very, very important. Uh, Lou, let me ask you a question, you and, 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 and Sal. Um, over the years, they have, they're, they are literally in the field of development. How many housing units have you built uh, along commercial? Sal, how many have you done now so far? A thousand units. And Lou, how many have you done? Well, over the last 50 years, 3,000. 3,000. And it's not just in one community. You have throughout the region. You have throughout the Merrimack Valley. Uh, it shows you that we have people that actually know how to do it, so they can talk to you about the issue of permit, they can talk to you about the issue of finance, and they can talk to you about community issues. That's very, very important. And in addition to these two larger developers, we've got a number of small developers, I say small in terms of doing, you know, two or three or four or five or six units at a time. They are as, as important so that we continue to move forward in the initiatives. Mike Sullivan, when he was mayor, I remember this because the chamber sale, you were chairman at the time, we actually helped him. He had an initiative, which the current mayor, the painter, is following up, and I want to commend the Lawrence mayor greatly. Uh, Mike took vacant lots and said, we're going to turn those into housing. And Mike, do you remember, uh, Michael? You took and made one or two unit buildings on former vacant lots to provide housing. So it's that incremental growth that continues to help, and I think and so, so very, very important. So do we have any more comments or questions from out there? The SEDS committee, we heard from that, Ian. Tell us about that real quickly before we, we're going to close in a couple of minutes, but we, we're part of it, the Chamber's part of it. Tell us um, what you're trying to do and when will we get done. Sure, yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, so Gerard Witten uh, is from the Merrimack Valley 
planning commission like I am, so the SEDS committee is stands for Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. Um, that is a group of economic stakeholders from across the region, and we bring together monthly meetings to strategize what the next five years in economic development is going to look like here in the Merrimack Valley. Now, this is a strategy that is mandated by the U.S. Economic Development Administration, where we can get funding from U.S. EDA with projects that come out of this strategy. However, we see it as a larger um, overarching strategy, not just for EDA, but for our whole region, so we can strategize what, uh, what will look like in five years. So that's a partnership with all the municipal staff across the region, nonprofits, private developers, everyone that we bring together to look at the, you know, the, the whole strategy. And, and I want to say that not everyone agrees on all the issues, but we sit there and we discuss it, we work it out, and we're going to come to a great conclusion with a great report, and it's going to give a vision and a blueprint for the future. And I want to commend you and, and, and Gerard and the whole team at the Planning Commission, but it's what needs to be done. People have to come to agreement on how we move the economy forward. And I want to say this, and I say this as a Chamber President now, you know, the reality is that the business community is so very, very important because that's where the jobs are. One of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to work on, on, on the issue of finding people. So we're working together with the unions, with the, probably the only chamber, they tell us, definitely in the state, perhaps in the country, that actually works with the AFL-CIO, the Mass Central Labor Council, on initiatives, and one of the initiatives that we're working on is uh, there's going to be at Whittier Tech coming up, and the superintendent is here somewhere. Was here in the back, Maureen Lynch, the superintendent. Uh, there's going to be a, a union-led job fair at Whittier Tech for Whittier Tech students so they can tell the students, they can show the students there are jobs for you when you leave Whittier. And vocational jobs are so very, very important. That's another initiative that the superintendent, who's a member of our chamber board, obviously is involved with. The chamber's actively involved with it, but as we hear from every one of our businessmen and women, that's a concern. So there's a number of initiatives that we're working on. As, as, as Sofan spoke about the initiatives of, with minority-owned businesses particularly, we want to move them forward. We want to see everyone advance uh, our women in business initiatives. Um, Christy, I think you've been a speaker on one of our programs. If you're not, you will be. Um, the idea is to let people know that it's okay to say, I want to advance. I want to start my business. Here's the help that's available. And it's so important. But again, I want to say thank you before we close once again to the secretary and to her staff and to all the people here. Because I want to tell you this. When we get a call from businesses, we have to call to the state. And let me tell you this, you're not going to be happy if I tell you I couldn't get anybody. Let me tell you what we get. And a question we give, an answer we give, or they respond back to you. And that's what we want. And I want you to know that, Madam Secretary, that everyone that we talk to has been so, so helpful and continue to be, as well as our local economic development directors. So give them all a round of applause. But I want to say thank you uh, to all our speakers, because this is an opportunity to bring people together. Sal is saying, Joey, you're done. I know Sal by now, right? Uh, he can't pull the plug because we're on a court over here. <laughs> and Louis, Louis uh, already thought that. But uh, Safan, Gerard, Michael Sullivan, our chairman, and again, our special guest, the secretary. Again, it's so easy for them to say, come to Boston. I'm tied up. I can't get there. But please give her a round of applause. Anyway. So,